Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, it's our great honor at the Arab Reform and Democracy Program of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University to, in a way, welcome back um, our former uh, visiting scholar and dear friend, Amr Adli, who's going to talk to us today about uh, the research he's been doing for several years and the book uh, that he has finished now on cleft capitalism, the social origins of Egypt's failed market making. We're very proud that we were able to host Amr for a period of time when he was working on this and related work. Uh, and uh, we feel a great sense of solidarity with all of you uh, in the scholarly and civic world in Egypt uh, and elsewhere throughout the Arab world. This is our uh, final seminar of the 2019-2020 uh, academic year. Uh, and we're really excited to close it out um, with such a uh, strong uh, academic presentation. I wanna turn the floor over now to my colleague, the uh, uh, Associate Director of the Arab Reform and Democracy Program, uh, Hesham Salam. Thank you, Larry. Uh, on behalf of the program at Arab Reform and Democracy at CDDRL, I would like to welcome uh, you all to this uh, intellectual quarantine that we've established here on Zoom to continue our important conversations about social and political development in the Arab world, uh, notwithstanding the limiting circumstances we face in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis. I would like uh, to extend a special welcome to everyone who's joining us from outside of the Bay Area and whom we normally don't engage with in person here at Stanford, whether those uh, based out of the US uh, in Europe uh, or the Middle East, and especially the many colleagues who are joining us from Egypt, from Cairo University and AUC and elsewhere. And speaking of Egypt, today's talk is titled The Social Origins of Egypt's Failed Market Making. And our speaker is my friend, my colleague, Amr Adli, whom I will introduce in a moment. But before I do so, I would like to recognize the co-sponsorship of the Arab Studies Institute in Washington, DC um, of this event. And for their efforts to publicize it, I should also mention that this Zoom webinar is currently being broadcast to thousands of people through uh, the Facebook live feed of uh, Jadaliya, also known as Jadaliya, or if you're uh, an Egyptian like myself, you would call it Gadaliya. Uh, one of the electronic publications of the Arab Studies Institute. With that, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Amr Adli, who is um, no stranger to CDDRL. He is a former postdoc here uh, at CDDRL, and he is now an assistant professor of political science at the American University in Cairo. He worked as a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Middle East Center. He is a fellow co-editor of Jadaliya's Egypt page. Uh, Adli received his PhD from uh, the European University Institute in Florence. He is the author of State Reform and Development in the Middle East, The Cases of Turkey and Egypt, which was published by Routledge in 2012. His publications have appeared in a number of peer-reviewed journals, including uh, Geoforum, Business and Politics, Turkish Studies, and the Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, he is uh, author of Cleft Capitalism, The Social Origins of Egypt's Failed Market Making, which is due for release this month by Stanford University Press, uh, and is the subject of uh, today's talk. Uh, and the research for uh, this book uh, was at least in small part supported by CDDRL, so Amr, we're happy to take at least partial credit for it and maybe to collect some royalties from you later on. <laughs> With that, I will hand it over to you, Amr. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Hisham. Thank you, Larry, uh, for uh, the, the opportunity to present this uh, uh, book, upcoming book, uh, um, in, at this uh, forum. Uh, as uh, you too have uh, said, I'm no stranger uh, to CDDRL, and actually, the the, the book, uh, the idea uh, uh, of the book itself, originated at uh, CDDRL when I was a postdoc there, and I. Uh, uh, was uh, assigned the task of, uh, of writing a report on uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, system reform in Egypt and Tunisia. And uh, the, the extensive fieldwork that I got to do in both countries, uh, I ended up uh, focusing on, uh, on Egypt, but I, I worked on, on both uh, countries. The kind of work that I did was the very beginning of uh, questioning many of the, uh, uh, well, theoretical and conceptual uh, frameworks uh, to which I uh, once uh, subscribed, uh, well, uh, uncritically to a great extent. Uh, 
So uh, this book is about Egypt and uh, it, it aims uh, or it hopes to go beyond Egypt at the same time. Uh, so uh, it's uh, an attempt at developing an approach uh, that would, uh, 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 well, like uh, hopefully be tried with other countries in the Arab region, especially on oil economies that got integrated into the global division of labor progressively in the last uh, three or four decades. Uh, as well as uh, uh, the extension of this uh, framework just for the trial uh, in uh, uh, other parts of the of the global south uh, so um, let me let me start by sharing the the, the screen uh, well the, the book took almost uh, seven uh, years of uh, of of work and uh, it's it's a bit hard really to to go through uh, most of it in uh, in, in, in just uh, uh, 30 minutes, that is uh, definitely a, a challenge. Uh, but uh, what I'll try to do is uh, just to uh, uh, pinpoint uh, the uh, uh, most important, uh, or what I see as the most important uh, findings and potential uh, contributions, and then uh, we can open the floor and continue the discussion, hopefully. So, okay. So I, I've shared the, the presentation. I hope that you, you can all uh, uh, see it. So this is the title of the, of the book, Cleft Capitalism, the Social Origins of Egypt's uh, uh, Failed Market Making. Uh, and the, uh, the, the, it, it starts really by examining uh, what happened in Egypt. It's, it's a kind of a what went wrong uh, question. Egypt was among the uh, very first Arab uh, countries next to Tunisia, as a matter of fact, that uh, attempted at uh, uh, undoing much of the uh, state-led import substitution strategies of the 50s and 60s that prevailed over their uh, economic uh, uh, policies, uh, as well as uh, foreign policy uh, orientations uh, uh, following independence and to embark on uh, free market uh, uh, making uh, reforms as of uh, uh, the uh, uh, well mid 1970s what we refer to as the opening up or uh, infiteh so what the book does is that it reconstructs much of the uh, history from an institutionalist uh, perspective of uh, egypt's uh, uh, trajectory the trajectory that the country took in an attempt of establishing or adopting a market based uh, capitalist system uh, one that uh, was based uh, initially, uh, as expressed, for instance, in the October paper, uh, the document that was issued by pr the late President Sadat, and that marked the uh, uh, beginning of uh, Egypt's uh, uh, transformation, I wouldn't say transition, but rather uh, uh, transformation almost uh, uh, 50 uh, years ago. Uh, and of course, this uh, kind of transformation did not happen in isolation of the rest of the world. This was uh, part and parcel of the uh, neoliberal turn that was uh, uh, happening, uh, or that started in the global south with the, with the 1973 uh, coup in, in uh, Chile and the kind of, uh, of market reforms that were introduced by the Chicago boys uh, uh, during or under the dictatorship of, uh, of uh, Augusto Pinochet. Uh, and uh, ones that, uh, uh, of course, in the 1980s witnessed the rise of uh, uh, Thatcher and, and Reagan, and, and hence the transformation of the role of the IMF, uh, of the World Bank, of uh, uh, many other uh, uh, regional and international uh, organizations that were heavily involved in, uh, the, uh, in Egypt's transformation when it comes to the kind of trade liberalization, when it comes to structural adjustment, the privatization of state-owned enterprises, uh, the kind of deregulation, etc. So uh, Egypt, to a great extent, was one variant of a rather uh, global uh, uh, transformation that was happening across the global north as well as the uh, uh, global uh, south, and uh, uh, one that uh, came to uh, include the, all the uh, uh, first, second, and third uh, world, especially with the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and the assertion of the ideological hegemony of uh, neoliberalism, the Washington Consensus in the 1990s. Uh, however, Egypt uh, was a variant of a global uh, uh, transfer, uh, like of, of a global trend, meaning that uh, the Egyptian state uh, was not simply a transmission belt of uh, uh, this kind of global change. This global change was not uniform. Uh, 
uh, it was shaped to a great extent by domestic institutions, and that's why it is held throughout the book that domestic institutions and the kind of social political coalitions uh, in Egypt that upheld them were quite uh, important in shaping how this neoliberal, whether uh, through uh, market mechanisms, conditionality of international financial institutions, or ideational linkages related to neoliberalism as an ideology, how they were shaped and how they uh, got translated in the uh, uh, exact domestic context in uh, Egypt. And in this, of course, uh, I subscribe to a whole body of literature that nowadays has been increasingly uh, uh, stressing uh, how uh, 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 domestic, national, as well as sometimes even local institutions uh, are the ones that uh, uh, create varieties of integration. They are the ones that uh, uh, say to a great extent how uh, countries get uh, uh, integrated. And this, of course, is uh, uh, a bit critical, a bit, I'm saying, a bit critical to uh, the uh, uh, literature that holds neoliberalism as this uh, monolithic universal uh, uh, force that has reshaped the world. I'm, I'm not contesting that it, it has dominated uh, uh, much of the transformation, but much of the variation, and this is something that will uh, become very significant in understanding what happened exactly in Egypt, as well as the uh, 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 region in like North Africa and the Middle East more uh, uh, generally. So uh, uh, I hold Egypt as a successful transition to a failed market order. And here comes the point that much of the talk that you have among neoclassical economists and many uh, commentators and critics in political science as well as economics that uh, uh, are uh, critical of, uh, uh, of Egypt as a case uh, of an economy that did not go through enough liberalization or enough privatization uh, are uh, to a great extent uh, uh, baseless because the Egyptian economy did witness considerable transformation. It was rather uh, gradual, not very consistent, but this, some, this is something that happens uh, uh, worldwide. It's, it's very hard to uh, uh, see a complete rupture in a rather uh, a short period of, of time when it comes to the economic uh, uh, structure and the kind of institutional regulatory framework that uh, uh, governs it. Uh, so uh, uh, what I, I'm using here is the uh, Heritage Foundation's Economic Freedom Index, which is, well, quite, quite uh, uh, to the right and quite conservative. And if you take a look at, the, uh, uh, at that uh, index, uh, and it's broken down in the, in the, in the book, you can see that the, 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 the Egyptian economy has witnessed considerable liberalization and uh, a considerable increase, and this is even more important, in the share of the of private sector enterprises, and here, of course, I'm, I'm using private sector very generically. It refers to all uh, uh, entities uh, that uh, uh, have uh, or own their own means of production. And their share has progressively increased from the 1970s uh, all the way until uh, uh, today, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, if you take a look at the figures, it is uncontested that Egypt has uh, ended up as early as the 1990s, by the way, with a private sector dominated economy. Uh, so this is not a case where uh, it's a, uh, uh, the problem that uh, not enough liberalization has taken place or the private sector was never allowed to take over. Egypt ended up with a great variation of uh, privately uh, owned uh, enterprises, uh, ranging from big businesses to small ones. Uh, many of them were micro, many of them were not really enterprises in, 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 in any Western uh, sense. And this is what we'll go uh, through. But overall, overall, it's a case of transformation. The share of, according to the World Bank, the share of uh, uh, the uh, private sector in Egypt's uh, overall uh, uh, GD, non-hydrocarbon uh, GDP was around 75%. And if you include the hydrocarbon uh, sector, it, it would uh, decrease to 70%, which is still quite sizable, by the way. And uh, it has come to uh, dominate some of the most critical uh, sectors, uh, including construction, uh, uh, the manufacturing, uh, uh, agro uh, business, agriculture sector has always been privately owned. So the thing is that we really have, uh, uh, or we have a real uh, uh, private sector in the case of Egypt. One that is of course extremely variegated, one that is an amalgam of uh, uh, a great many uh, uh, social as well as economic uh, actors. And this is what cleft capitalism is all about. But it is not a story of uh, unfinished reform. It's rather reform in the sense of market uh, making that did not lead to the uh, rise of uh, a market-based development model, uh, contrary to the uh, neoliberal uh, precepts. Uh, 
uh, contrary to the IFIs that uh, were pushing for these reforms, and contrary to those who adopted these reforms, and many of, of, who, of, of which subscribed to uh, neoliberalism as an ideology, especially uh, when Egypt ended up with its business-oriented uh, 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 governments in the, in the last decade under uh, Mubarak. But if you take a look at other uh, indicators as well, uh, uh, when it comes to investment, gross capital formation, uh, uh, which is an indicator of development, indicates a clear uh, uh, shift into, uh, uh, in favor of uh, the private sector. Uh, of course, much of this has to do with the decline in uh, uh, state uh, uh, expenditure on investment. Uh, uh, but overall, it's a sign of the private sector becoming more central in supplying of investment. Of course, not much investment was, was, was supplied, which is another problem, but it's, again, it's about the departure from this uh, uh, state-dominated uh, uh, model. Uh, most importantly, it's about employment as well. That uh, 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 the, the figures that I'm citing here are uh, the ones that go back to 2007, because this was the uh, closest date to where the book ends. The book stops at 2011. It doesn't go uh, 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 further than, uh, than this. Uh, and it, it cites there that the public sector, uh, including the huge uh, bureaucracy in uh, like state uh, bureaucracy or civil service in Egypt, uh, came to employ around 34%. Nowadays, the figure, by the way, is, is, is around 27%. So Egypt is a country where much of the employment happens through the private sector, either through wage labor or either through uh, self-employment uh, or people that are running their own uh, micro enterprises, etc., which is a, a very interesting sign of uh, how deep the market came to penetrate uh, uh, in urban as well as rural areas. Of course, the, the book is focusing on the urban side rather than the uh, rural uh, side. So uh, all of this together is one that pushes uh, uh, me to uh, uh, start with, with my, my, the problem is that it was a successful transition to a failed market order. Why was it failed? Because it did not deliver much of, of, of what was promised when it comes to development. Uh, 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 when it comes to inclusive growth, when it comes to the uh, improvement in the standards of living uh, and uh, better quality employment for the majority. Uh, so uh, uh, if you take a look actually at some of the most traditional uh, indicators, uh, ones that you have in uh, mainstream uh, in economics, by the way, as an assessment of development without having to be critical to how we conceptualize development, you can see simply that the overall performance was rather uh, dismal. Uh, with growth rates that were uh, not capable of keeping up with uh, population growth. Uh, uh, and, and hence, if you take a look at the last three uh, or four decades, you will see simply that not much improvement happened uh, to the uh, per capita income of uh, uh, Egyptians. Whether you blame uh, high uh, population growth, high population growth itself is a result of underdevelopment. It's, it's not just a, a cause uh, of it. So this is something that we can uh, of course, uh, uh, talk about. Uh, but uh, uh, more importantly is uh, how uh, uh, employment itself was created. You, you, you have had chronic unemployment and more importantly, underemployment uh, in Egypt. So uh, people in the working age, it's a very young population. Many people ended up in uh, 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 jobs uh, that were of uh, uh, very low value and hence of very low uh, wages and high precariousness. So uh, uh, this is uh, one of the interesting things that uh, could be uh, traced back to uh, the structure of the private sector itself. The idea that uh, uh, Egypt ended up with, uh, um, uh, and this is a, a dimension of cleft capitalism, the idea that you have this uh, bifurcated or trifurcated uh, uh, structure of very large, few businesses on the top, many of which are privately owned, some MNCs, multinationals, and some are uh, state-owned ones that did not create much employment because they were uh, as many of these big businesses in uh, 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 um, um, uh, energy intensive, capital uh, intensive, technology intensive sectors, not very much labor intensive, while much of the employment itself, this uh, low wage, low productivity employment was created by the broader base of the private sector. One that uh, uh, was uh, uh, dominated by micro enterprises, not even small and uh, medium ones. So the problem really is not about the development of small and medium-sized enterprises. Much of the literature, especially in finance and business, is about how uh, 
uh, in Egypt as well as beyond Egypt, in much of the global south, about uh, 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 credit extension, about skill acquisition in small and medium-sized enterprises. The problem is that many of these countries, and Egypt included, don't have a population of small and medium-sized enterprises. They rather have much of what we call the private sector is made up of these micro-enterprises, much of which are made up of self-employed uh, people that don't hire anybody else, and that's, th that's why they are not really enterprises by any means, together with many of these subsistence-driven, like survival uh, or necessity-driven uh, 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 entrepreneurs uh, that are micro, they remain micro, they are born micro, and usually they, uh, none, like very limited uh, uh, numbers of, of these, get themselves upgraded into the ranks of uh, small and medium-sized enterprise that could be later on addressed by uh, uh, credit extension or skill, or, or skill acquisition or, or, or whatnot. And this is, of course, what was caught in the, uh, uh, much of the development literature, and I engage with this as the missing middle syndrome. And the middle, missing middle is one that refers to uh, economies that have much of the value created by a, a few very large concentrated big businesses at the top, and th these are floating over an ocean of very uh, small, uh, tiny micro enterprises that never grow actually into the rank of small and medium enterprise, and that this is where they are missing. Of course, the problem is that much of this literature is too technical, uh, geared very much towards the uh, discussion of finances, and I, I, I try to bring in uh, uh, political economy and economic sociology to problematize this throughout the, the book. So, uh, what does the book really engage with? It, 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 like my concern when I submitted the, the book uh, manuscript, and I, I have to say that I was quite uh, lucky because I ended up with people that were uh, open-minded enough to tolerate some of the heresies, especially on the right, because the, the book is an assault pretty much on neoclassical institutionalism. It's not the first book to do this at all. Uh, there's actually a very long literature that I subscribe to, but it, it is definitely an attempt at bringing the critique to neoclassical institutionalism and many of the precepts that you have in uh, uh, neoclassical institutionalism and uh, in, uh, of course, uh, much of the uh, neoliberal uh, ideological precepts that overlap uh, with it into the study of development in Egypt and the Middle East and North Africa. So it's, it, it tries to merge uh, uh, both. So uh, explaining the failure uh, as, as, as it stands in the literature, uh, it can be uh, very uh, cartoonishly, I, I have to say, unfortunately, but we don't have uh, much time. Uh, I go through this in more details in the, in the book, naturally. Uh, that to the right, uh, inspired by neoclassical institutionalism, the argument was that this failed market uh, making in Egypt as well as many others had to do with the rise of non-market-based capitalism. So crony capitalism, state capture, the idea of how the private sector that emerged, especially big businesses, uh, 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 were uh, based on rent-seeking, uh, 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 enjoyed monopolistic and oligopolistic positions uh, that created unnatural uh, profits that predated on other uh, private sector enterprises, uh, other uh, consumers that were too uh, related to the state, you have this unholy marriage between wealth and uh, uh, power. So much of the literature that we have, uh, a very big literature, to which I ironically contributed, by the way, in the, in the past, and it's, it's, it, it's, I, I find it, uh, 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 well, uh, a bit, uh, uh, well, interesting anyway, uh, that I'm, I'm like, I, I wrote my name among those uh, uh, whom I critiqued in, 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 the, in, in, uh, in, in the development of the, of the thesis. So I, I did subscribe to this, and uh, I, I ended up with many questions, actually, about how sane is this uh, neoclassical institutionalist precept, the one that blames the lack of uh, universal property rights, institutions, contract enforcement, rule of law, etc., that blames it for the lack of development, for failed market uh, uh, making. Uh, uh, this is something that developed in, in Southeast Asia, uh, applied to uh, the Middle East and uh, East Asia uh, and, and Eastern Europe uh, later on, the post-Soviet world. And I used to subscribe to this until, of course, uh, uh, one ends up reading more extensively, especially economic sociology stuff, about uh, cases uh, 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 like uh, cases in China, China is quite variegated, but cases in China, as well as many cases in Asia, Southeast Asia and East Asia, ones that are uh, claimed to be success uh, stories. And uh, these are countries uh, uh, that could deliver development, uh, yet uh, did not really possess uh, these uh, sine qua non uh, market uh, holding institutions like uh, universal property rights, uh, like rule of law, law corruption, etc. And uh, this I found very detrimental to much of what was uh, written about the uh, Middle East and uh, North Africa. Uh, 
uh, especially that uh, you would come across researchers working on China, for instance, and I, 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 I had an encounter uh, with, with one of them, and uh, he was working on a comparative study uh, in a university in China between Egypt and China. And his question was extremely, extremely interesting, uh, uh, which was, uh, Egypt has the same state business relations like China. Why isn't it working in Egypt while it's working in China? And that tells you much, by the way. I'm not trying to say that China is, is, is a model here, not far from it, really. But the idea is that these are cases where development through integration into the global division of labor, the capitalist division of labor, could deliver for a significant percentage of the population, despite rising inequality, despite the dispossession of, 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 of other uh, classes. And you have a very interesting literature that was developed about this. But they definitely ended up with higher growth rates and better standards of living for a majority, something that did not happen in the Middle East and North Africa. To the left, and, the, and I'm a bit critical uh, uh, of this as well, uh, and this is why the, the, the argument was a bit heretical to the right and to the uh, uh, left, uh, was that blaming neoliberalism as such uh, uh, is something that I found as problematic because we have uh, more successful cases of integration into the global division of labor, especially in, in, in Asia. And uh, more importantly is that much of, of, of the leftist uh, uh, accounts uh, underplay the fact that the Egyptian economy had failed on the uh, production front rather than just the distribution and redistribution ones, meaning that you had economic relations, economic institutions, and economic uh, uh, that ended up permitting the uh, uh, activities of many of the economic uh, uh, actors and failing eventually in the production of much of the value that could later on be distributed or redistributed. So uh, that itself is something that raises questions about which kind of institutions were there. And of course, the idea that uh, 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 global integration per se, much of it that did not happen, by the way, on neoliberal terms, if you, especially if you take a, a, a look at, at the cases of Asia, you have a, an excellent book like Bad Samaritans, for instance, one that shows clearly that many of these countries did not really adopt free market uh, uh, economics uncritically. But in the case of Egypt, uh, Egypt is not a case of sweeping neoliberalization either, by the way. Egypt is not Colombia. Egypt is not Chile. Uh, Egypt is not uh, post-NAFTA Mexico. And, and, and that's why uh, it's, it, it, it's much more nuanced and we need a much more uh, uh, critical uh, ex explanation for why there has been a very uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, 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 reinsertion or insertion into the global division of labor. So uh, that uh, leads us to one of the very central concepts in the, uh, uh, in the book, which is market integration. And market integration here simply refers to the intensity with which uh, market, different market actors in uh, a national uh, context contribute to the creation of value. And in that sense, an unintegrated market, and this is what I'm uh, arguing for in the case of Egypt, is that it is a case of an, un of an unintegrated or non-integrated uh, uh, market uh, order, and hence it was cleft, that the vast majority of the actors that ended up being either pulled or pushed into uh, the orbit of market of production for market exchange uh, uh, were never uh, involved in the creation of uh, and hence the distribution of uh, economic value. And I, uh, uh, and there is of course an implicit element of, 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 uh, of comparability here, especially with uh, East and Southeast Asian countries that are dubbed as the most successful. Uh, this is the case exactly that the missing middle syndrome uh, is uh, a, 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 an expression of this structural uh, problem of all of these uh, actors that are uh, uh, simply not engaged in the uh, production of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, value. So uh, um, um, the idea that we have more than 2 million micro enterprises that uh, uh, em employ uh, less than five uh, workers, and these are usually endowed with very little capital, very little skill, very low productivity uh, uh, activities. And uh, if you simply go through uh, some comparative uh, data about uh, the uh, uh, percentage uh, of small and medium enterprises rather than micro ones, uh, and small and medium enterprises here are the ones that managed in cases like Taiwan, in cases like Korea, in cases like, uh, 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 and even less, less impressive cases, by the way, in Southeast Asia, if you take a look at uh, uh, Malaysia or uh, uh, Thailand uh, uh, or Vietnam, the, the idea that these have managed to uh, uh, scale up in the past three or four uh, uh, decades, mainly through capitalization, and they ended up contributing more to uh, employment, uh, 
and to the uh, uh, generation of uh, growth uh, exports and the share of output that they uh, had. So uh, these were cases of more integrated capitalist orders, uh, if, if we uh, see this as a spectrum, as a continuum. Uh, while the case of Egypt and many other countries, by the way, in uh, uh, North Africa, if you think of Tunisia, if you think of Morocco, all of these cases, the way they got uh, reinserted into the global division of, of labor led to the creation of these extremely unintegrated uh, uh, capitalist uh, orders that had these uh, 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 missing middle uh, 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 all over. The idea that you have a very big private sector, uh, but one that is uh, made up uh, predominantly of micro enterprises that do not grow. That's the, that's the dynamic element in it, is that they are born tiny and they remain tiny because they are denied any access to capital primarily. And here comes the point that I hold that capitalization is what precedes and even preconditions the emergence of formal market actors and hence market institutions. And that's, that's, that's uh, like a Marxist critique to, a, to an extent uh, to uh, uh, market making. It's unlike the story that is given by uh, uh, Frederick von uh, uh, Hayek and, and all of, the, of, the, of, of his disciples that we find in neoclassical institutionalism. It's not that you create the right set of institutions that have to do with uh, private property, with the, rule, with the rule of law, with contract enforcement, and then market actors would uh, emerge and, and the market order would function. It's rather as, and historically, uh, uh, this has been the case, that you have market actors that emerge. Usually these are very socially embedded. These are the ones that depend on certain governance uh, mechanisms that are less universal, are more uh, uh, particular. And uh, the idea that they could scale up is what later on enables them to establish integrated capitalist uh, orders. And then you end up with uh, um, the rise of uh, market uh, institutions at the very end, not at the very beginning. Especially if there is an agency point. Who's going to establish these institutions, by the way? That's the issue. For whom? Who's going to push for them? Because institutions are representative of social political coalitions. So uh, uh, the, 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 the point that I'm giving here is that capitalization is really, really important here. The idea, that the, 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 and the idea of capitalization is that it's a political process through which certain market actors get to uh, 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 scale up. And the broader the uh, 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 addressees or those who are addressed by these capitalization attempts, usually by state institutions, the more integrated orders you end up uh, with and the more developmental uh, these uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, orders are, something that did not happen in much of North Africa and uh, the Arab region. So what I try to, to say here is that um, my extensive fieldwork, the one that I had when I was at Stanford and, I, 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 and afterwards, of course, when I went back to, to Egypt, but it was a moment when I could do uh, a, a survey, uh, do, conduct fieldwork, meet people, talk to them, etc. And at that time, you could see that it was not the lack of this Weberian uh, spirit or ethic uh, of uh, the mentality of calculability and the production for exchange. It was not this thing. It was not. You had actually many entrepreneurs. And I, I have all of these anecdotes. I, I mentioned some of them uh, in, 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 in the book. The problem was uh, rather an institutional restraint because beyond a certain, of course, you have people that depend heavily on uh, uh, social uh, uh, structures. Uh, family, uh, friends, clan-like institutions and networks, etc., for uh, initial capitalization. But beyond a certain point, uh, no scaling up can happen uh, unless you have uh, 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 more of a form of political imb embeddedness. Like here, uh, state-regulated institutions, the ones that are in charge of the uh, uh, access to uh, physical and financial capital. And uh, these are the ones that the problem in Egypt was that they were the ones that uh, 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 were almost confined to the capitalization of a few very large ones. This itself is not a problem because this is something that happened all over. And that's why cronyism per se is not really a problem or even, even corruption, unless it reaches levels that are very debilitating, uh, 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 like in, 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 in the Congo, Zaire, or in, in Iraq, where uh, you have actually predation. But in, in, uh, and, and that is usually related to a resource curse uh, context. But in the case of, of, of many of the countries in, in, in Asia, uh, 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 it's the, the, the problem really was, uh, uh, in comparison to, to, to those guys, the magnitude of the actors that are included in these capitalization attempts. So it's not that we had big businesses that had special relations with the state, because this is generic. This is always the case. It doesn't matter whether they are rent-seeking or that they are 
uh, 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 crony because many countries could develop despite this or maybe thanks to this, I, I don't go there. But the idea is that we have this in common. So what was missing really in, in, in those cases and not in, in and, and what was missing in, in our case and not in those cases was a vibrant medium and small sized uh, private sector that could scale up enjoying a certain set of institutions that simply were missing. And these institutions are not private property, are not uh, uh, rule of law and contract enforcement, unlike the many tenets that you have uh, uh, held or upheld by neoclassical institutionalists, they were rather uh, 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 institutions uh, that were uh, uh, responsible for the uh, uh, um, 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 uh, creation of opportunities for capitalization. So the situation of cleft capitalism is one that it's an institutional condition that refers to uh, different enterprise populations within a national context that are operating according to distinct uh, uh, rules. And hence, they are differentially governed when it comes to accessing finance, land, technology, labor, and information, as well as to market outlets. And this over determines their opportunities for growth. Uh, under uh, uh, such a setting, the large majority of private enterprises have been denied access to inputs and consequently their chances to upscale and to grow. So, uh, I'll just like, I don't have, I don't think that we have uh, uh, enough time. So uh, I talk about cleft capitalism where we have three business subsystems. So it's not really about population uh, of enterprises per se, but it's rather about business uh, subsystems. And this is something that I uh, borrow from uh, uh, business, uh, 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 like from, from much of the literature on, on, on business. I take a look at how the, the, the enterprises uh, uh, generally as entities that produce, how they are organized, so intra-business, inter-business, which is the other dimension, and then transactions with the state that involve economic as well as regulatory transactions. And this is the uh, uh, table that I hope, I know it's, it's quite small, uh, well, that it, it, it talks about three subsystems in uh, 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 Egypt, uh, uh, the, the, the first is called Beledi uh, capitalism, which is a transliterated uh, uh, word for uh, 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 folk, uh, for, like a popular form of, the, of, of capitalism. Uh, the other one is Dandi capitalism, which is uh, 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 like one that refers mainly to the uh, ones that could scale up, including some medium-sized enterprises as well. And then the more familiar crony capitalism. So what I'm arguing for is that under cleft capitalism, we have the three subsystems living parallel uh, uh, to uh, each other, and hence giving this trifurcated uh, uh, structure. So uh, looking at the three dimensions, in the case of, uh, 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 if you look at the intra-business organization, valid capitalism is social market actors, low differentiation between what is social and what is economic. So this is a Polanyan case to a great extent of high social embeddedness, but the only difference is that it is market oriented, meaning that I exclude necessity-driven uh, entrepreneurship, people that uh, uh, produce ma mainly for subsistence. Here I'm, I'm referring to cases that are genuinely more entrepreneurial, people that are interested in production for exchange and for repetitive profit making, which is how Max Weber defined what uh, 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 capitalism uh, uh, is. Uh, with dandy capitalism, uh, these are more corporate market actors, and I go into lengths actually in, in uh, uh, the, 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 con the reconstruction of many of the accounts of how some of uh, uh, Egypt's current uh, uh, privately owned enterprises could become shariket, meaning that they could uh, uh, become more differentiated. Uh, it's, it's really on a continuum. They're more differentiated from uh, the social and the political into becoming economic uh, uh, entities. Many, uh, many people familiar with the Egyptian context will disagree on, on this, especially that they might see that they uh, uh, are all cronies uh, with very uh, intense uh, links with the state. It's a dense links with the state. Uh, but with crony capitalism is, is this case where you have low differentiation between the political and the economic. You have these enterprises that are very much dependent uh, in their very existence and operation on uh, the links to uh, the state. Uh, the other one, when it comes to the rules governing access to inputs and uh, market uh, uh, outlets, with parity capitalism, you have this system where uh, 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 private social capital substitutes imperfectly for the inaccessibility to physical and financial capital on impersonal basis. So it's very personalized, highly socialized, depending on private information, et cetera. Uh, 
With the other subsystem, the one of dandy capitalism, you have private social capital internalized within corporate government, meaning that you have family dynamics that are there. You have these economic dynasties that are still important, but the idea is that they are uh, internalized into corporate uh, structures. And then much of the access to uh, uh, inputs and market uh, outlets happen uh, uh, through uh, 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 more impersonal, more anonymous, on more anonymous basis. And this is one of the reasons why they could uh, uh, scale up. In the case of crony uh, capitalism, which is the third system, and you might have firms, by the way, that exist in both uh, systems. Uh, uh, asymmetrical access to political uh, power is one that leads to asymmetrical access to inputs and market uh, outlets. The dealing with the state. With vanity capitalism, there is what I call low adaptation, meaning that you have survival. Social capital helps in navigating through much of the bureaucracy, it lowers transaction cost and uh, uh, risks of predation. And I go through very interesting, uh, well, at least it was interesting for me, I hope it will be as interesting for you, uh, 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 mechanisms and modes of adaptation, uh, 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 like uh, bringing in formal and informal into this very semi, what I call the vast gray area uh, that uh, link uh, uh, both uh, uh, together in order to risk, uh, to limit uh, risks to create flows of information that help in what I call low adaptation, because many of these firms don't actually go out of business, but they don't grow, they don't scale up, they don't become uh, the uh, 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 much missed uh, uh, small and medium uh, uh, enterprises. And then uh, uh, the case of dandy capitalism is rather one of high adaptation, where you have state predation is unsystematic uh, uh, and uh, uh, political uh, 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 and politically uh, targeted. So it's it's interesting that Egypt does have a long history of private property and of uh, a, a private sector that managed to evolve historically since the 1970s without being organically or systematically or solely dependent on capitalization by the state. It's, it's, it's interesting. I, I try to give evidence there because I'm, I'm, I'm challenging uh, much of the uh, uh, conventional uh, wisdom and much of the popularly uh, held opinions about this. Uh, so uh, that's in a nutshell, really, because <laughs> These, these are three different uh, uh, chapters, and it's, it's a big book. It's not extremely uh, uh, big. So uh, one of the things, I, I'm not sure how much time I uh, have, so I'll, I'll try to uh, wrap up as uh, uh, quickly as uh, uh, possible by going into the political economy uh, part of it. So much of the discussion uh, that preceded was about the economic sociology uh, element. Um, and now it's about the political economy part, about how this uh, happened. So what I'm saying here is that uh, much of the uh, uh, needed institutions for the capitalization of the broad base of the private sector that could have enabled the rise of uh, a vibrant, small and medium-sized uh, uh, sector, uh, and these I, I call intermediate institutions. And intermediate institutions are, are ones that could uh, 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 extend, um, uh, as I'm saying, especially physical and financial capital to uh, some of the, of the broad base. And this went missing in the case of, uh, of Egypt. Why did this happen? The answer, very uh, uh, briefly given, is the kind of social political coalition that dominated the process of market making in Egypt since the 1970s. And there I tried to go in, 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 in details actually about the, uh, uh, what I see as three phases preceding the 2011 uh, uh, popular uh, uh, revolt, uh, uh, the three phases of uh, uh, market uh, uh, making, uh, when or where the uh, uh, configuration of the social uh, political coalition in charge of uh, the institutional framework governing the process itself uh, 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 changed. Uh, so uh, uh, what I could find here is that the, there has been throughout the three phases in the 70s and then in the 90s and, and then in the 2000s, a strong uh, presence of multiple diverse, usually uncoordinated bureaucratic actors, by the way. So there is no conspiracy here. They were not that coordinated, not very harmonious. But these were the ones that were there. And uh, they were the ones that have always prioritized the presence of centralized, hierarchical, and authoritarian organizations and institutions in a way that raised the cost of accessing finance and land for the majority of market actors, including some, by the way, that already had their own private capital. But the bigger initial capital was 
the more capable some of these actors, the ones that made it eventually into the ranks of the few medium and uh, large enterprises, without being necessarily very much dependent on the on the state. And we do have some of these examples, and I try to give them in the in the in the book. Uh, ones that don't really fall into the categories of uh, being captors or or cronies, uh, at least fully. Uh, but the, but they could jump very high barriers. The vast majority of the of the actors could not. They lack the initial capital. And the chapter on finance, and I go into a, a history of the contemporary uh, banking sector in Egypt, financial system more generally, but I focus on the banking sector, given how central it, it is. And uh, these people are uh, simply uh, uh, ones that uh, lacked all uh, political, cultural, social, and uh, uh, physical capital that could have enabled them to uh, have more capital. So they were caught in this situation where they lack capital and then they don't have capital. So, uh, um, um, well, the, the conclusion, because I, I, I need to end here, is that uh, a Marxist recipe for capitalist transformation implies, departing from von Hayek, I talked about this a, a bit, is that it's not really about the distribution of property, of private property rights and the enforcement of contracts. It's rather about the distribution of capital, access to capital, even if unevenly. The idea is that if it includes a broad base of private actors, even if through cronyism, even if through patronage, because I, 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 I go through some of the mechanisms, especially in Asia, uh, where uh, much of the capitalization efforts that created a vibrant medium and small uh, 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 private sector that could scale up were not really ideal at all. They were very politicized, but the idea was about the magnitude. So the problem in Egypt was not having uh, 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 a few cronies. The idea is that the, the state capitalized only those uh, guys. It did not attempt, it did not uh, uh, manage. It, it's, it's much more uh, dramatic than just having the will. But the, the, the dynamics within the, the, the social political coalition in charge of defining how the state was related to the process of market making never enabled the rise of these intermediate uh, uh, institutions. So the private accumulation for the many is really the key issue here. Uh, sorry, the primitive accumulation for the many. The idea that you have political mechanisms that create these intermediate institutions and hence could enable, could extend the badly needed uh, 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 capitalization. Uh, a third uh, 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 finding was uh, the Polanian basis for capitalism is that social relations do create much of market coordination, even in the absence of universal rule of law, public information and contract enforcement. And this is what I call market oriented embeddedness, that you have uh, uh, social uh, relations, cultural uh, norms, social uh, structures as well, like clan-like institutions, families, uh, uh, etc that uh, uh, help in the uh, uh, creation and the facilitation of market relations, even in the absence of formal institutions. And this has been the case historically. Capitalism developed through many of these uh, private or semi-private uh, 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 order institutions, as they were called by Abner uh, uh, Graef. Uh, 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 and uh, it was only by the late 19th, early 20th century that we ended up with the public, uh, uh, publicly uh, held uh, or, or uh, public uh, institutions that upheld market uh, uh, relations. Uh, um, I, I hope that the presentation made any sense. Uh, I had to hop from one uh, element to another. I just tried to uh, 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 underline some of the basic uh, points. Uh, the book is really full of details. Uh, it took a full year in order to uh, cut almost 25% of it. So it was even full of uh, more details. I'm very much into telling stories. The book is full of, uh, of, of, of stories. So uh, I, I hope you found this uh, useful and helpful. And I look very much forward for uh, your uh, uh, feedback and questions. So thank you very much. Back to.